Soy is just one of those controversial foods. It seems that no matter what new data comes out there, soy is always chastised as the enemy of a healthy diet. And in some cases, a lot of people can even say it puts your health in grave danger. But let's talk about what that other data is and let's separate the truth from the lies. We're separating fact from fiction all about soy today. And this is part two of our special series on this groundbreaking new study that is providing relief to millions of women who are going through menopause and soy is playing a prominent role in this. And so to separate that fact from fiction for us today is Dr. Neil Barnard. Sir, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Chuck. So part one of this podcast series, we learned about the WAVE study and the promising results that it offered. And then we also learned, as I said, that soy is a huge part of the study. But I would imagine, because of the prevailing theories about soy, that there are a lot of people who are going to hear about this study and they're going to be like, mm, yeah, it sounds pretty good, but soy just makes me nervous. Um, you do hear these myths quite a lot. And the, the big one is... Uh, goes like this. Soy products have isoflavones in them, which are natural compounds, but maybe those compounds could cause breast cancer because they might adhere to the estrogen receptor. If you go online, you'll see lots and lots of writing like this, um, and which also means that scientists have had a lot of time to study it and see what it is. Um, Chuck, let me show you uh, a couple of slides really quickly, if you don't mind, because it's important to look at the data on this. Sure. Um, in 2008, researchers did a meta-analysis, and that's where you combine the results of prior studies. In this case, it was eight prior studies. And the groups that they really focused in on were people who consumed a lot of soy. So you could see, is it safe if you consume it in you know, pretty large, large quantities? tofu, soy milk, miso, tempeh, every day. So they looked at Asians and Asian Americans. And what they found kind of blew everybody away. The connection between soy and, and cancer was that soy reduced the risk of breast cancer. And it, it did it quite a lot by about 29%. In other words, the women consuming the most soy had 29% less risk of breast cancer compared to women who kind of neglected soy. So soy looks like a preventive, but they went further. Uh, at least five different studies have looked at women who had cancer treatment already. And in some cases, they avoid soy afterwards. In some cases, they continue to have it. It turns out that those women who, cont who continue to have soy, those having the most soy, greatly reduce their likelihood of dying of cancer. Um, and in this slide that you're seeing, the red bar those are women who didn't have much soy. They had very high mortality. The yellow bar is women who had a lot of soy. They had had in the past estrogen receptor negative cancers. That's one kind of cancer. The green is estrogen receptor positive cancers. Um, all the women had had cancer in the past, but those who consumed the most soy had about a 25 to 30% reduction in the likelihood of their cancer coming back and killing them. And that was true regardless of the cancer type, whether it was estrogen receptor negative or positive. So bottom line here is that soy doesn't cause cancer and it doesn't accelerate cancer growth. It does the opposite. So coming back to this myth, on the screen now I'm putting up the, the three uh, major isoflavones that you get from soy, genistein, daidzein, glycetine. And there are actually two different kinds of estrogen receptors. There is the estrogen receptor alpha, which is mostly in breast tissue and the uterus tissue, and estrogen receptor beta, which is in bone and in the urogenital system and in your blood vessels. And so it turns out that the isoflavones mostly affect the estrogen receptor beta. Now, it's more complicated than this, but the way to think about it is that sometimes something that attaches to a receptor, it's like stepping on the gas. It's accelerating whatever that receptor will do. There are other times where it's like stepping on the brake and stopping bad things from happening. So the soy isoflavones are the brake. Uh, they seem to reduce the likelihood of getting cancer. And if you got cancer, they help people to survive. So there you have it, Chuck. 
Yeah, let me let me jump in here and actually ask you a question. So we just saw that slide that was talking about the re reduction in risk of cancer. But then I'm thinking about the fat content that is found in soy. And as we've talked about previously on the exam room, a diet high in fat really puts you at risk for all kinds of chronic diseases, including cancer. So uh, with soy being a quote unquote fattier bean, uh, really, I mean, help me understand what's happening here. Yeah. Um, it's a great question, uh, Chuck. We don't have all the answers, but when we look at the legumes, you know, black beans, pinto beans, navy beans, and so forth, um, they're extremely low in fat. Maybe 4% of their calories are in fat. But there are some exceptions. You know, peanuts are a legume. Um, as your friends will tell you, they're not a true nut, they're a legume, and they're really fatty. And soy is kind of between, the, let's say, the black bean and the peanut. Something like uh, 40, 45, 47% of its calories come from fat. So it's fattier than others. Um, which is perhaps why it's, it's so um, useful in culinary applications. The fat quality is much healthier and the isoflavone content, which is sort of the natural magic against uh, menopausal symptoms is much, much higher than we see in other uh, beans. So that seems to be what does the, what, what does the benefit. So a uh, lot of what we're talking about right now, specific to breast cancer, but I know that there are a number of men who also listen to this show, a high number of men uh, that listen to this show. So I'm, I'm curious if some of these same principles also translate to, say, prostate cancer. Um, they do. Um, we need more research uh, here. And the research we have on prostate cancer is not as advanced in the world of nutrition as is, say, with breast cancer. However, uh, the studies that have been done show that the uh, improvement in preventing uh, a bad outcome of prostate, uh, in prostate cancer is about the same magnitude as for women with breast cancer. In other words, plant-based diet, getting away from dairy, but adding the soy-based foods seems to be helpful too. All right. I feel like uh, I kind of interrupted this wonderful presentation. So why don't we go ahead and, and uh, hop back in there? Uh, let me pull this back up for those of you who are listening right now. I've pulled it back up on the screen. Uh, you can check this out if uh, you want. It's on our YouTube channel. And there's a link to that in the episode notes right now. But Dr. Barnard, as you were, my friend. OK, um, I'd actually like to just tackle a question that's going to be on a lot of people's minds is why don't you just prescribe estrogen. So you give, give a woman a prescription, it'll knock out her hot flashes. And you know what? It will. Um, however, go online or look at the piece of paper that comes with your estrogen prescription. And in the prescribing information, you see what's called a black box warning. This is required by the FDA. And here's what it says. If you take estrogen alone, and, and this is any, any brand, um, it increases the risk of endometrial cancer, that's uterine cancer, stroke, deep vein thrombosis, that's blood clots in your legs, uh, and dementia. And if you take the combination of estrogen and a progestin, which is the, the, more, the more usual way because the progestin is there to prevent the endometrial cancer, but it increases the risk of breast cancer and stroke and deep vein thrombosis and dementia, and we're gonna add myocardial infarction, heart attacks. All of these things are linked to, to these prescriptions. Um, now, when we discuss this with our medical colleagues, there's a huge amount of debate on this. But the Lancet weighed in in 2019 with a big, big, big study. They did a meta-analysis combining the results of 58 prior studies, and it was huge. They looked at more than 100,000 women who had developed breast cancer and tried to sort out what was the role of HRT. Here's what they found. The doctor prescribes HRT says, we're only going to keep you on this for a couple of years. If you used it for one to four years and then you stopped, your risk of getting breast cancer is 17% higher if all you took was the estrogen. And if you took the combined estrogen and progestin, it is now 60% higher. Let's say you stuck with it five years, six years, seven years. Now, if you just are taking estrogen, 33% increased risk if you're taking the combination, 108% risk. So that's about a, a doubling of it. And the Lancet authors made this chilling conclusion. And, and let me just read it to you. In Western countries, there have been about 20 million breast cancers diagnosed since 1990, of which about a million would have been caused by menopausal hormone therapy use. Um, now, if everybody is, is, is thinking this is terrible, and it is, there is a little bit of a, a, 
uh, good news. Uh, some women will use estrogens, not the ones that you swallow and not the patch, because those are designed to go systemically, to, to, to uh, change how your, your whole body feels. There are some women who, who use only vaginal estrogens, and they use that just so that they don't, they don't have vaginal dryness and pain on intercourse. And there's not that much uh, systemic absorption. And in the Lancet analysis, that didn't do anything. It didn't have any danger that they could, could uh, detect. So that seems to be OK. Um, so there you have it. Um, the uh, estrogen prescribing information says use uh, them either with or without pres uh, progestins at the lowest effective dose for the shortest duration consistent with treatment goals and risk for the average women. And so what's the shortest duration is um, zero. So uh, back to you, Chuck. I, I have to say, I really think that based on the work that we've been able to do with diet approaches and comparing them to the risks of the drug approaches, rather than negotiate with, gee, how many years can I get away with this uh, before cancer hits me? I think the answer is, let's work on the cause. The cause is diet to a great degree, and we can fix that. And now let's talk about uh, a big part of that diet that was uh, this study. And that was, I believe it was a half a cup of soybeans uh, that uh, the participants were asked to eat every single day. And as we said at the top of this segment, soy is a controversial little bean, Dr. Barnard. And I know that uh, that information you were talking about that's floating around on the internet, uh, boy, there is an awful lot of it out there. So uh, with the time that we have remaining today, I would love to be able to talk about some of those bigger myths and and see what the, what the actual data says. Um, I guess there are a number of issues. Um, probably the number one question that we hear about after cancer is, what about genetically modified beans? Um, and I think that's a legitimate concern. Uh, there are so many GMO crops out there. When I go back to my childhood home in North Dakota, I see all along, all on this side of the highway, it's the GMO corn, and on this side of the highway, it's GMO soy. But the good news is um, that when you buy uh, a pack of um, tofu or something like that, it, it has the word organic on it. By law, it cannot be GMO. The GMO soy is cattle feed, um, chicken feed feed for hogs. Uh, the people who need to think about this are the meat eaters who are getting the cholesterol and the fat and the GMO uh, feed crops that are going into animals. So, so GMO, I think it's a legitimate issue, but when you're buying organic soy, it is, it is, it is a non-issue. Let me ask you this, uh, kind of going back to where soy got its wrap from. Uh, we talked about this, I believe it was, it must have been over a year ago at this point, but I thought that it was a really interesting point, is that the the information that got out there about soy being this supposedly risky food, that really only came from one or two studies that were done many years ago at this point. Is that correct? Well, it, what it really came from was animal studies. Um, and in some, in some cases, lab bench studies. Um, and when researchers actually started looking at human beings um, and looking at those who consume soy and those who don't, that's when you started to really see that humans were not like the lab rats at all. They didn't behave like them. Um, and it, there, was, there was one researcher quite a number of decades ago that was really pushing this hypothesis. Um, and it's been completely discredited. Uh, vir virtually every oncologist nowadays knows that soy is actually a cancer preventive. Um, by the way, though, to, to Chuck, I, sh I should mention, some people might be saying, well, wait a minute, you know, why are you promoting soy? We don't necessarily promote it. Um, and, and in case anybody's interested, we are not funded by the soy industry or anything like that. And um, we, we don't take funding from these food entities. But on the other hand, it's something that could be helpful for people. And it has sort of almost a medicinal effect in a natural way. It's optional. You don't need it, but it's certainly beneficial and not harmful. Here's a question for you. Uh, more and more people are turning to plant-based milks now. Uh, given the fact that we're learning that soy has all of these health benefits to it, would you say that that uh, soy milk would be the healthiest option? I got to say, I really think so. Now, there, there are great options. And the option that works for you is the one that you like the most. So throw out the cow's milk, um, have almond milk, rice milk, hemp milk, oat milk. But soy milk has a couple of advantages. One is that the balance of macronutrients is better. The others have much less protein. Soy has a nice mixture of protein and natural carbohydrate and a little trace of fat. And so for a lot of people, it's a more nutritious uh, source. It's also the only one that schools will 
uh, typically say this meets our guidelines. Um, and also it has the, the isoflavones that kind of work that magic. So um, I, for one, have been happy to see that soy is still there on the shelf, even though all the other uh, milks are coming in. And let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag as we do on our Wednesday shows here on the exam room and take a few questions from viewers right now. And we have one from Wendy who's wondering whether, well, about soy milk specifically, should she be drinking the unsweetened version of soy milk versus the sweetened version? Does sugar take away any of those health benefits that we've been talking about? It doesn't. The amount of sugar that, that is in there is really trivial. Um, if you prefer the unsweetened one or if you find you just do better with it, that's fine. But the sweetened ones are A-OK. -okay. All right. Next question comes to us from uh, JL. Big fan of soy milk. Is drinking three cups of it every day too much? Is that just too much fat? Um, it's fine. Um, that's a lot. Um, but no, that, there's no known health risk to it. The only, when I say it's a lot, my only thought is you want balance in your life. You know, have some broccoli too. You know, have, have vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans and, and don't make your meals all just, uh, all, all just liquid. Peter has a follow-up to the GMO soy that uh, you were just talking about. He says, my budget's awfully tight. Is it okay if the soy is non-organic? Yeah, I'm, well, it's, first of all, it's going to be dramatically better than, if you're having soy bacon, it beats the heck out of bacon that came out of the pig. Um, if you're having soy milk, it beats the heck out of milk that came out of a cow. So whatever whatever brand you're getting, great. Um, I always encourage people to get organic everything to the extent that they're able to. Naya says, I've been uh, looking in my grocer's freezer, and she says, a lot of times on these vegan meals, I see something called soy protein isolate. What is that, and does that have any of the health benefits that you've been talking about? It's an extremely versatile part of the soybean. They they in a bean, there's protein, there are some natural starch, there's a little bit of fat, there's fiber. And what uh, culinary scientists discovered a long time ago is that if you take out the protein and you get it away from the, the starchy part to, to remove that, you can fashion it into a sausage or into bacon or all kinds. I mean, one day they're going to make snow tires out of this, Chuck. It's amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't try this at home. Um, but anyway, it's perfectly fine. It is, is it a processed food? Sure. Would you be better off with something that actually looked like a soybean? Probably so. Um, but the soy protein isolates are fine. Important question from Liz. How can I go about having this conversation about soy with my doctor? He has as recently as two weeks ago told me not to eat it. Um, I feel your pain. Uh, may I suggest that you take the study that we just released, uh, the WAVES study, um, which you can actually just print out and share it with your doctor, or, or if you have a copy of my book, Your Body in Balance. Um, every chapter, including the menopause chapter, is carefully referenced, and you can just put in a little post-it note and share that with your doctor. It includes the references to all the soy issues that we've been discussing today, and uh, I do grand rounds at hospitals uh, where all the doctors get together and we talk about these issues together and, and doctors are eager for, for good new information and I, I'm sure your doctor will be too. All right, let's take a couple of more before we wrap things up here for the day. This is an interesting one from Naveen. Are soy chunks from TVP healthy? Is that the same as a soy protein isolate? Yeah, it's effectively the same. There are many different variations on the theme, but TVP, textured vegetable protein goes back decades. It was kind of the original veggie burger and they're perfectly fine. I think uh, what we need to do is kick around some ideas for a better name than TVP. I, it, <laughs> it just, I mean, that just to me does not sound appetizing in the least, yeah. even though it, it can be quite tasty. Uh, far we have come. I'm telling you. Uh, final question. This one is from Mitzi. Uh, boy, this is one I'm sure a lot of women are wondering as well. Is soy safe for pregnant women? Yes, and, and for children as well. Um, keep in mind, when women are pregnant, they get all kinds of unsolicited advice, all of it well-meaning. You need more liver, you need more meat, you need this, you need that, you need the other thing. What you need is a really healthy diet. And the diet should be plant-based. You need vitamin B12, you need it, your baby needs it. Um, but soy products are a, a very useful part of that. They've got good protein, they've got real, very healthy traces of fat, they've got fiber and can certainly fit into to anybody's diet. 
I'm going to sneak one more in on you. I, I lied there. Bob just sent this one in to me. He said, thank you so very much for talking about prostate cancer. But I'm curious about soy and the effect that it could have on my chest. Is it true that soy <laughs> will, will cause me to grow boobs? Oh, my goodness sakes. Um, the other myth that won't die, uh, man boobs. Uh, yes, you go into the locker room and that's what guys are talking about. Here's, here's what they're saying is that there are guys, a lot of them, who have some enhancement of their breast area. And they're thinking, what caused that? Uh, and somewhere along the line, somebody on the internet said it's, it's soy. And I have to say, you can easily prove that, it, that it's not. Just go to the beach in August and you'll see a guy there who's gained a little bit of weight and he's pulling his shirt off and he's, you see he's got man boobs. Go right up to him and say, how much tofu have you eaten this week? Um, and he will say to you, what are you talking about? I don't eat tofu. And I'm a pizza guy. I eat cheeseburgers. Um, the reason that he has breast enhancement is because as he has gained weight, his fat cells convert testosterone to estrogen. That's what fat cells do. They make estrogen. So when guys gain weight, they will get some breast development from the estrogen that's in their blood. It's not from tofu. It's from eating the fattening burgers and pizza and all the things that unfortunately are pervasive in America now. All right, Bob and the other guys who are watching this, listening to us right now, thank you very much. But uh, this this series of podcasts, this is really for the women. And gentlemen, I promise you there will be shows for you in the future. But right now we need to continue our discussion about the WAVES study and tackling hot flashes through diet, helping women through menopause by making changes to their diet. And Dr. Barnard, in the next show, I'm really excited about this one. You have three steps for how women can tackle menopause by changing their diet. That one, I think the practical advice is going to help so many women. I think they will. And by the way, for the men, I don't mean to neglect you. Um, <laughs> my, my book, Your Body in Balance, has plenty of chapters for you, too. Um, and it's not just all about uh, that, those kinds of hormones. It's everything from diabetes to thyroid disease, male sexual function, prostate cancer. It's all in there. And the recipes, you're going to like them, too. So we're not neglecting it. All right. That's going to wrap things up for today. But if you want to hear all about this groundbreaking study, go back on the Physicians Committee's Facebook page and YouTube channel. Look for that first episode where Dr. Barnard really walks us through exactly what the WAVE study was, the groundbreaking, extraordinary results that it provided. Then that will set the plate perfectly for the next episode to tackle menopause through diet. Dr. Barnard, we will talk to you again soon, my friend. Thank you, Chuck.